This video is part 2 of a free part series. You will find the link to part 1 in the description. There is this pernicious rumour, especially in more left-leaning circles, that Turkey was at the brink of joining the Nazis during the Second World War, which simply isn't true. The origin of that myth is the Soviet Union and Soviet propaganda. In Stalinist propaganda movies, Turks are often depicted as devious, backstabbing schemers helping the Nazis behind the backs of everyone while pretending to be neutral. The reason for this open hostility by the Soviets is however rather simple. All state entities inherit the geopolitical ambitions of the entities they replace, and the Soviet Union is no different. Just like its predecessor, it couldn't help but have a desire for Istanbul. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Kremlin archives revealed that Stalin was actually negotiating with Hitler for permission to invade Turkey and divide it up with him, just as they had done with Poland. What Stalin didn't know is that when he started these negotiations, Hitler was already planning the invasion of the Soviet Union. By and large, the Second World War was uneventful for Turkey. It accepted droves of Jewish refugees and prepared itself for a potential invasion, but by and large it had other things in mind. Something, however, did appear briefly that would years down the road cause more trouble. When Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, a group of Turkish fascists emerged to proclaim the need for Turkey to join the Nazis and conquer Central Asia to create a Turkish empire for a Turkish race. These people, led by the then unknown Alpasan Turkes, were considered to be an annoyance and nothing more. Ataturk's successor, Ismet Inönü, didn't appreciate this rabble and had them sentenced to several years of hard labour and went back to working on rebuilding the Turkish society. The continuing Soviet hostilities towards the Republic led to the government abandoning one of Ataturk's changes to the state. They abandoned neutrality and allied themselves with the United States and by that extent the Western Bloc. The Soviet Union added an additional roadblock to the advantages of the Anatolian geography. That geography is very inviting to tie deeper connections into the Balkans and the Black Sea coastline. Romania, for example, has the Carpathian Mountains separating it from the European heartland. And the long distance from Crimea through the Russian front gave whoever inhabited Anatolia the opportunity to exert power over it. With the Cold War, that potential sphere of influence and trade was gone. Turkey needed to search for outsiders and chose the United States. In exchange for two military bases on Turkish soil, the Turkish army received massive financial aid and American weapons. Turkey was to be the southern bulwark against the Soviet Union. And many forget today that from the 1950s to the 1980s, Turkey had the second largest and second strongest military in NATO. This increased the power of the military as a political force within the state. Ataturk's economic policies had been mainly left-wing, and these policies became cornerstones of his party, the Republican People's Party. In later years, he started reforms within the country's social system and economy, which would shape the Republican Party into becoming the center-left, secular, social democratic party that it is today. Organized labor unions, national industries, state-subsidized economic reforms in agriculture and industry, a progressive taxation system, as well as a social welfare and security net. In Turkey, the 1940s were dominated by the implementation of these social and economic reforms until something got in the way, that pesky democracy that Ataturk wanted to achieve. Let's get back to the previously mentioned Erziehungsdiktatur. Harald Neubert, the man who coined that term, was a socialist. Now, before you turn off, try to stick around, because despite the political objections you may have to his beliefs, Harald Neubert was actually onto something. He himself wanted to figure out why socialism failed in the 20th century so the socialists of the 21st century could learn lessons on how not to fail again. He wrote, The dictatorship of the class became the dictatorship of the party, and ultimately the dictatorship of the leadership. According to Marx, on the other hand, it should be the power of the vast majority of society, the proletariat. Under these conditions, the Soviets lost their importance as original revolutionary democratic organs of power. The party assumed their function. Under Stalin's influence, Marxism was degraded to an interest-led ideology with the primary purpose of justifying its practical politics with its pragmatic twists and wrong decisions. The current crisis of traditional Marxism-Leninism is that it was ultimately only of limited use in perceiving the world as it was and as it is. With all the plurality, it is necessary to build forms and principles of building consensus on strategic and programmatic questions, and for the purpose of uniformability. 
What should the principles of a new internationalism in contrast to the previous communist movement be? Above all, a pluralist constitution of the international movement or common left party, equality and autonomy of each party, democratic consensus building, openness, critical solidarity. So, Harald Neubert's political beliefs, derived from a historic analysis, were that for socialism to be revived after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it needed to abandon dictatorship, authoritarianism, the we are smarter than thou and know what is best for you attitude. Disagree with his political convictions all you want, but he is very much right about the fundamental causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And these causes, I believe, can be attributed to many states built on revolutionary elites and top to bottom revolutions. As an example, look at the growing resentments and growing secular attitudes amongst common Iranians directed against the forced religiosity of their regime. States founded on authoritarianism continue that legacy even as democracy settles back in, however on a fragile base. As an example of that, it is no coincidence that Greece has the highest police brutality in Europe, as its police force, for decades, was used as a brutal tool of silencing dissent by various military dictatorships. People resent being forced, and the way governments, states, and state institutions come to be and how they are built heavily influence how politics is conducted. The strict secularization of Turkey was by and large enforced, and therefore people, especially in rural, poor, conservative communities, started to increasingly resent it. But unlike the Soviet Union, democracy eventually had to come. Ataturk demanded it before his death. And there was a growing dissatisfaction with many of the policies of the Republicans' People's Party, which led to the creation of the Democratic Party in 1946, founded and led by Adnan Menderes, who is often referred to today as the first Islamist. But that is not really true, or at least there's far more nuance to it than simply that. When people hear the word Islamism, they often tend to think of this, or this, or that. When I hear the word, I think of this, a broad field of divergent political interpretations and movements who try to justify their political agenda and authority through the Islamic religion. And Islamism in Turkey is very different from Islamism in Iran or Islamism in Saudi Arabia or even Islamism in Egypt. The story of Turkish Islamism begins with a man called Said Nursi, a Kurdish cleric in Turkey who, during the Young Turk era, wrote reform pieces on adapting Islam into a modern age through what he called science for theologists and religion for scientists. He became part of the Young Turk government, was captured by the Russians during the First World War, escaped during the Russian Revolution and returned to Turkey. During Ataturk's rule, he retreated into the isolation of the mountains of Anatolia to think, write and formulate ideas. He was put on trial several times, charged with attempting to undermine the Republic. He continued writing and founded the Nurkuluk movement. He believed that Islam would have to adapt to the demands of a modern world and accept some concessions to democratic forms of governance, but still demanded the establishment of a unified Islamic state under Sharia with Mecca as a capital. This movement and his writings would form the basis from which the modern Islamist movements of Turkey would evolve. And Said Nursi threw his support behind Adnan Menderes when the first elections came in 1946. The ruling prime minister Inunu pulled a trick by holding the first elections merely two months after the founding of the Democratic Party, guaranteeing him a victory as Menderes could not organize a sufficient campaign in time. But four years later, during the next election of 1950, Adnan Menderes became the first democratically elected Prime Minister of Turkey. Menderes came from a wealthy family of landowners in Edin, and to think of him as just an Islamist is a false description. His opposition was mainly to the economic policies of the Republican Party. He was in most points an advocate of conservative liberal economic policies, the deregulation of the economy, the removal of subsidies, the cutting of the welfare state, privatizing national industries, and stepping away from state-guided planned economics. The support base of his Democratic Party were large landowners and the newly forming industrialists and business owners of the newly created urban and metropolitan areas. The idea that Menderes was an Islamist stems from his campaign promises to permit the practicing of Islam in public and permit it to regain a cultural relevance again. 
In no way did Menderes, throughout his terms as Prime Minister, ever challenge the separation of religion and state itself. He undid the ban on the call to prayer, he permitted the broadcasting of religious messages on radio, which had been banned by Ataturk, he introduced religion as a subject in the school curriculum with the caveat that parents could decide to reject it for their child, and permitted the opening of religious schools under strict government supervision. He also lifted Ataturk's ban on the building of new mosques and churches. These changes were marketed under the motto of return to Islam, but were in no way an attempt of re-Islamization of society. The Democratic Party, from a modern perspective, had more in common with conservative parties around the world. Liberal economic policies of deregulation, cutting off welfare spending in combination with religious moral overtones. His economic policies initially bore fruit. Productivity increased, economic growth increased, and large parts of the Turkish industry modernized. This economic success in large parts modernized the Turkish economy and brought more capital to the country. But it also sowed the seeds of his downfall. His trade deals and economic modernization policies were mainly focused on the agricultural sector. He opened deals with the United States that allowed for the import of modern American farming tools such as tractors to build a modern mass production agriculture industry, no longer focused on domestic food production but the export of enormous quantities of cheap fruits and vegetables to Europe. But only a few Turkish farmers could actually afford those, mostly only wealthy large landowners like Menderes himself. The result of this was that small farmers went bankrupt and then sold their small farms to large landowners who then became even larger large landowners, who then became even richer by exporting produce abroad, which then caused domestic food prices to skyrocket, then causing the wealth inequality to go through the roof as hundreds of thousands of unemployed, bankrupted farmers and farm laborers flooded the cities and urban areas looking for work of which there was barely any left which combined with the fact that his government had cut down the social security net, created a socio-political environment that one could call gigantic cluster fudge. 70% of the Turkish population had been small farmers or part-time workers on large farms, and the vast majority of them were suddenly made redundant. These flooded the cities in large slums called Gecekondu, which is a term made up of the Turkish words for Gece and Kondu, meaning built overnight. These slums were utterly miserable, built on thin brick walls or even just out of clay. No heating, no running water, lack of basic sanitation, crime, unemployment. Life was simply harsh and miserable for those confined in such places like the Istanbul suburb of Kasim Pasha, which is barely a stone throw away and within sight of the wealthy districts of the city. In Kasim Pasha, the son of such a poor family, a certain Recep Tayyip Erdogan, spent his childhood selling postcards, receiving regular brutal beatings by his father and dreaming of being a football player. Menderes had a huge problem of his own making at his hands. He had been elected by and large by poor farmers who he had won by promising and giving them their religion and he had then proceeded to make most of them unemployed. By 1955, Turkey had been plunged into a severe economic crisis and he needed a solution to this problem. And the solution he found was to blame minorities. Menderes took advantage of escalating tensions between Greeks and Turks in Cyprus to rile up xenophobic mobs amongst the impoverished directed against Christians and Jews. At the peak of this toxic campaign stood the Istanbul programs of 1955, in which angry mobs set fire to and vandalized dozens of Christian churches, foundations, schools, as well as synagogues and non-Muslim cemeteries. Large parts of the last remnants of the Greek minority fled to Greece, and 15 people were killed. However, this campaign strategy, if you can even call it that, got him re-elected. But it also brought him under the increasing suspicion of the army, whose generals saw in this riling up of religious hatred and violence against non-Muslims, which they literally had to stop by rolling up tanks in Istanbul to stop the rioting mobs, as a grave attempt at undermining the secular institutions of the state. They were also increasingly uncomfortable with the economic chaos and saw his economic deregulation reforms as a massive failure. During Menderes second term in office, the situation worsened. Unemployment kept rising. Now even the urban middle classes that had been built before him started losing their jobs and inflation skyrocketed. 
who was being questioned everywhere and the opposition had a field day. Menderes reacted by seizing ever-increasing control of public broadcasting, turning it into a propaganda tool that exclusively broadcast material in his favor, clamping down with state repression against opposition members, clamping down with police brutality against protesters, as well as shutting down newspapers and journalists that dared to criticize him. And in an attempt to regain the masses of unemployed former farm workers and farm laborers who had voted for him before, he promised to lift more secular restrictions on Islam. It was then when Menderes made his final mistake. After the army chief of staff, General Kemal Gürsel, expressed his displeasure at the increasing state of the country, Menderes fired him and threatened to seize the army's constitutional political powers as the protectors of the republic which Ataturk had given to them. Gersel organized a coup that overthrew Menderes in 1960. He was put on a show trial and charged with undermining the Republic, sentenced to death and hanged with several of his ministers. In a gruesome spectacle, the army had pictures taken of his body as it hung from the gallows to be published in Turkish newspapers. There are many videos out there by idiots, but also by people who should know better, claiming that all the military coups in Turkey happened to clamp down on Islamists. And that is simply not true for later coups in particular, but with this one here, it is worth pointing out that the reasons are not as easy to pin down. You could blame the lifting of the restrictions on religion, but those liftings of restrictions were minimal and didn't challenge the secular nature of the Republic. You could just as much blame the catastrophic consequences of an overly zealous liberal economic policy of deregulation. You could blame Menderes' xenophobia-built re-election and increasing despotism. But you could also blame that he tried to subdue the army under the power of a civilian government. Or maybe it's all of these reasons combined. Half a century later, the remains of Menderes would be exhumed to be buried in a large tomb, and a generation of Islamist politicians would rewrite much of his history, mostly leaving out all the ugly bits, and declare him a martyr of democracy. There is, however, one important and enduring legacy of Menderes' government, something that you could call a politics of revenge. Menderes had shamelessly abused the power he had as prime minister to shut down newspapers, crack down on opposition as much as he could get away with, and use public broadcasting for his own propaganda. He wasn't a dictator, but with declining popularity he became increasingly despotic. From this moment on, almost every prime minister who would follow him would do the same. The institutions of governance intent to be impartial would be increasingly used to exert revenge against political opponents, silence the press and spread propaganda by whatever party was in charge. Turkey had several military coups in its history, but one often overlooked fact is that the army never ceased control of state affairs. The generals always underwent the same ceremony, almost as if there was a set of state protocols for doing a coup. They would arrest all members of the government, seize control of all government institutions, and then gather at the Ataturk Mausoleum in Ankara to salute and bow before his grave in a proclamation that his legacy had been restored. Then they always handed government power over to a civilian government in an election. The post-coup constitution of 1961 is widely regarded to have been the most democratic constitution the country ever had, as it was the first to separate powers within the republic and made the right to protest and the right to strike constitutionally protected rights. But even this couldn't hide the fact, made evident by the coup of the previous year, that the army had enormous power over the state Subsequent governments would continuously raise the salaries of generals in hopes of avoiding a coup. The military budget kept rising and rising to appease the army, but not all of it went into actually buying military equipment or modernizing the army. By the 1970s, the Turkish army's pension fund, OYAK, became one of the most powerful economic institutions of the country, with investments in 60 major corporations in sectors such as banking, steelworks, mining, and energy, with annual profit margins of up to a billion dollars. This gave the Turkish army, which officially was to be kept out of economic policy, a degree of influence within the economy. The army also didn't cancel any of the religious liberalizations that Menderes had conducted, probably hoping that with this measure, the religious needs of the conservative population would be satisfied, and no more demands for lowering restrictions on religion would be made. 
The elections of 1961 brought the Republicans back in charge, but they lost the next election to the Justice Party, which was basically just the reincarnation of the Democratic Party. This set the tone for one defining political binary of the Turkish Republic for decades to come, the two main political forces of the country, a western coastline of wealthier cities and urban areas economically orientated around industry sectors, service sector and tourism, which was secular and politically liberal and left-leaning, and the eastern Anatolian countryside. The economy there mainly revolved around agriculture and mining, very religious and politically right-wing and conservative. The 1960s would also start another chapter in Turkish history that would significantly reshape its own and foreign societies, Anwerbepolitik. As the Turkish economy was in turmoil, the German economy was booming. At one point, there were simply more jobs than there were Germans, resulting in a German policy of opening to foreign labor within the German economy. Between the 1950s and 1973, Germany imported hundreds of thousands of Spaniards, Italians, Greeks and Turks to work as laborers in the German manufacturing sector. For the Turkish government, this was beneficial. They could send their unemployed abroad and thereby lower the unemployment rate at home. They also believed that these laborers would come back home after five to ten years as educated mechanics and engineers to help the Turkish economy. Several hundred thousand did, but neither Germany nor Turkey anticipated that several hundred thousand would also stay in Germany and become part of the German social framework, thereby tying the German and Turkish culture and societies closer together. Turkish society in general had undergone some dramatic changes as the first generation of republic-born citizens reached adulthood, higher educated, more confident in political convictions and beliefs and willing to express those. 555K was the name of a protest movement against Menderes that Menderes had attempted to shut down. Turks were now willing and ready to go out onto the streets and protest what they perceived to be social injustices. What consequently developed was an increasingly pluralistic society. But don't confuse pluralism with diversity. Diversity as a political term only recently appeared as a descriptor and measure of the multitude of differing cultural and religious backgrounds within a society. Pluralism, however, is the existence of a multitude of competing political beliefs within a social framework that allows for all to be equally expressed. That pluralism is essential within a democratic society for it to function, and it increasingly showed itself especially in the liberal West. Labour unions, student organisations, public political discourse, Turkish society throughout the 1960s became increasingly more politically active. Meanwhile in the East, society however became more politically reclusive. Whereas the West found itself more tied into Europe both culturally and politically, the East saw itself as cut off and left behind. In his book Understanding Turkey, Gerhard Schweitzer describes a society in Eastern Anatolia that begrudged the fact that nobody spoke Arabic anymore, that saw itself as cut off from the Arab Islamic cultural sphere that it wished to be part of, a land in which people went to mosques to listen to Arab sermons even though none of them even spoke Arabic anymore. A land where the devoutest Muslims learned to memorize the entire Quran in Arabic despite not even speaking Arabic and therefore not even knowing the meaning of what they had memorized. In its first 20 years, Atatürk's Republic produced a generation that saw itself as modern and tied into a more global politique as part of the Western world, but it also produced a generation that saw itself as divorced from its cultural homeland and sphere against its own will. Pluralism may have arrived in Western Turkey, but it hadn't in the East, where the religious conservatives saw themselves as increasingly marginalized and excluded from the wider socio-political and cultural conversation. And then, everything blew up. And it happened where you probably didn't expect it to. The year 1968, with all its riots and protests around the world, hit Turkey like a bomb. Students and left-wing workers rioted throughout the streets of Istanbul. Marxist pamphlets, papers and other material were in wide circulation and even though the Communist Party was officially banned, there were simply too many for the police to arrest. Tensions escalated when the US 6th Fleet was stationed in Istanbul. A group of radical leftist students kidnapped family members of US stationed soldiers in Turkey. This, combined with the continuing economic decline, gave the Turkish army a new cause for a coup. The army overthrew the government, arrested the student leaders and had several of them hanged. But this, unlike the last time, did nothing to calm the situation down. The students now had martyrs and the 1970s would become a decade of vicious violence and almost civil war. 
and another conflict also flared up again during the early 1970s. Greece had been ruled by a fascist military junta known as the rule of the free colonels for the previous years. Throughout the last decades, governance in Greece had switched between various far-right leaders and the fascist junta of 1974 was probably one of the single most hated governments Greece had ever had. It was extremely authoritarian, imprisoning people for the most minor of offences, utterly and completely paranoid of the society it ruled, challenging its rule, it lashed out with extreme measures to such an extent that it banned public dancing and music, even kicking Greek musicians out of the country into exile. And when Greeks did protest against their regime, like the students at the Athens Polytechnic, the regime rolled over them with tanks. The only reason this regime was in charge, and the only reason the people of Greece still somewhat tolerated it, was because it claimed to be the only regime that could win a war against the Turks. It is easy to forget today that after the end of the Second World War, right up to the early 2000s, the relationship between Greece and Turkey was more comparable to the relationship between Pakistan and India or Israel and Iran than anything else. The two almost constantly seemed to be at the brink of war, and the sizable amount of that conflict revolved around the island of Cyprus, off the coast of southern Anatolia, its population being one-third Turkish and two-thirds Greek. Being that it was once part of the British Empire and the British fucked up almost every single decolonization they did, the place was left in a cluster fudge in the 1950s that resulted in conflict between the Turks and Greeks. This drew both countries into this conflict with a war over Cyprus that the Turks won and occupied the north of the island which was such an embarrassment to the Greek fascist junta who, remember, the sole justification for existing was that they claimed to be the only ones who could beat the Turks in war, that they were overthrown over a single night by a Greek people who had enough of them. These events may seem irrelevant to you, but they became of vital importance 30 years down the road. When Turkey throughout the late 1980s would try to join the European Union, the one thing standing in their way was Cyprus, and as long as Turkey will not get out of Cyprus, it will never join the European Union. Meanwhile in Turkey itself, things seemed to be completely falling apart. 1965 saw the arrival of two new political forces in the Turkish parliament. The MHP with 2.2%, the Turkish Communist Party with 5%, and the Socialist Turkish Workers' Party won 3%. Collectively, these three made up barely 10% of national support, but they would still dominate the 1970s. The MHP was the party of the previously mentioned Alpasan Turkes. It combined various elements of ethno-nationalist viewpoints with Islamic religious conservative social doctrine to form an Islamo-fascist movement. Even though you have more than likely never heard of the Turkish far right, you have probably still heard of some of the things they have done or encountered some of their symbols. For example, Mehmet Ali Akka, who attempted to assassinate the Pope in 1981, was a member of the Grey Wolves, a far right Turkish youth organization, which is closely tied to the MHP. Wolves, especially wolf mothers, are sacred animals within ancient nomadic Turkic mythology, where wolves led nomadic armies in victory against the Chinese. This movement combined various aspects of Turkic cultural, historical and mythical identities into something that is, I'm not entirely sure, Fascist movements in general have a weird habit of mixing the mythical with reality, creating a weird fudge together of political identities of contradictions. Communism in Turkey, just like communism everywhere, isn't as popular as the communists like to believe it is, so they resorted to violence and riots. The far right also noticed that they would never really ever get a chance to be in government, so they also resorted to violence. The result was that the 1970s were dominated by continuous terrorist attacks and violence at the hands of extremist elements of the far right and the far left, which would cost the lives of up to 5,000 people from 1975 to 1980. Far-right extremists would attack Alevites, Kurds, Christians, Jews and left-wing institutions, to which the far-left would react with attacks against the state, politicians, the army and the far-right. Within this chaos, two events would stand out as defining moments of modern Turkey, the Taksim Massacre and the Maris Massacre. All these decades ago, after the first attempt to overthrow Ataturk, the traditional workers' parade on the 1st of May had been banned. But in 1975, it was made legal again, which the Turkish left took advantage of by organizing massive parades of hundreds of thousands of their followers in Istanbul. When the parade reached Taksim Square, unknown right-wing terrorists shot into the crowds with machine guns. In the resulting chaos, dozens were killed and hundreds injured. Nobody was ever arrested or trialed for this attack, and the Taksim Square became a symbol for left-wing terrorists. Turks ever since, where they traditionally gather to protest. 
In Maras, after several left-wing terrorist attacks, far-right politicians blamed the local Alevite population. The tensions between the communities of the town rose and rose up to the night of the 23rd of December 1978, when a group of unknown men went through the city marking the homes of Alawites with red paint. Throughout the next days, incited by imams who had preached against the unbelievers, crowds of people rampaged through the streets, setting fire to those homes, dragging the people out and killing them, while the state did nothing to stop any of it. The Alawites are a religious community that originated in 7th century Baghdad. The name comes from Muhammad's cousin Ali, who Shia Muslims venerate as a martyr and rightful caliph who was denied by betrayal. The Alawites worship Ali as a prophet after Muhammad. They reject Sharia and most texts of the Quran as falsified after Muhammad by warlords. The religious preachings come from community leaders who pass down religious sermons by word of mouth and not in written text. They see pre-Islamic prophets like Jesus on an equal standing to Muhammad. Muhammad. They adopted Christian and Jewish religious practices such as celebrating Christmas and they even have religious rituals involving the drinking of wine and drinking of alcohol is not forbidden for Alawites. As you can imagine, all of this is nothing but the most extreme of heresy to most Muslims and consequently the Alawites spent most of their entire existence as a community being persecuted and maligned. Openly practicing your faith was equal to a death sentence. On the Ataturk's Republic, the Alawites blossomed as a community, finally coming forth out into the open. Alawites were free to worship and many became great admirers of Ataturk and his reforms. However, by the 1970s, the old hatreds started to return, mainly reinstigated by the the far right and the religious even to this day. The violence gradually escalated more and more over the course of several decades. Killings between radical groups became a daily routine and as the 1970s came to a close it seemed as if the country was about to collapse into civil war. It was then in 1980 that General Evren Kenan led another military coup. The public at first cheered the army, but what happened next would deeply scar Turkish society. The army seized control of the courts and executive and launched a massive purge. Under the pretense of cleansing society of communism, tens of thousands of Turks were arrested, tortured and thousands were killed and disappeared. Left-wing parties were forbidden, cultural centers were shut down, philosophy and politics classes were banned from the nation's universities, debating politics was forbidden at all educational institutions, dozens of prisons were built to stuff the thousands of arrested citizens into. Labor unions were forbidden, organized labor movements forcefully dismantled, and the conflict with the Kurds flared up into a full-blown war as the army engaged in a crackdown, marking the beginning of the Turkish-Kurdish war that still continues to this day. General Kenan was a symptom of his time, similar things were happening in Argentina and Chile at the same time, and in many ways Evran Kenan was the Pinochet of Turkey, as he proclaimed to exterminate communism in Turkey forever, the waves of arrests, torture and state killings he signed off to targeted far more people from all walks in life all across the political left of center. People were arrested and tortured for merely buying foreign books and magazines that the regime deemed to be subversive. And to this day, the mothers of those who disappeared between 1980 and 1982 protest each weekend demanding to know what happened to their children. In 2014, General Evran Kenan eventually had to stand trial for what he had done. And even though some in the extremist right may still praise him to this day, most Turks think of him as a butcher and mass murderer. As the torturing and murdering was being done, the generals and colonels of the army faced a problem. How does one exterminate communism? Communism is an idea and even if you kill all those who hold these beliefs, who is to say that they won't reappear in other people's minds? The army needed an ally, a new set of ideas, something with which they could combat communism in people's hearts and minds. And it was then, in search of that ally, that the generals made a decision that decades down the road would lead to their downfall. They went to the mosque. To most, the 1970s are a forgettable decade. In the Western Hemisphere, it is associated with crooked politicians, economic decline, the Vietnam War, the end of fascism, heroin, and music that one could at best call an acquired taste. 
However, the 1970s also represent a significant socio-political shift on a global level. Previous decades had been decades of left-wing insurrection, revolution in culture, politics and economics, and the challenging of traditional social norms that came to a climax in 1968. In comparison, the 1970s, in particular the year 1979, were the years of the conservative counter-revolution, which led to the new conservative movements of the 1980s that in some ways still last to this day. The election of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign and Helmut Kohl's election, which would drive a conservative market libertarian revolution throughout most of Europe and North America. Pope John Paul II's visit to Poland, which would end up being a substantial nail in the coffin of communism as the Soviet Union fell into an era of stagnation. A whole strew of military dictatorships in Latin America that would bring a sudden and violent end to the various socialist South American experiments of the 50s and 60s. The overthrowing of various socialist African regimes by right-wing generals ushering in an era of corrupt nationalist dictators from the Congo to Equatorial Guinea to Uganda to Togo to Ethiopia. The rise of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, who would end the Arab socialist experiments of his predecessors, which coincided in North Africa with the brutal Moroccan regime under Hassan II, which conducted mass arrests, torture and executions intent to purge the country of all left-leaning political thought as well as the build-up of an increasingly brutal and corrupt police state in Tunisia under its security minister Ben Ali, who through being in charge of the secret police was the de facto ruler of Tunisia long before he became prime minister. The rise of Deng Xiaoping as head of the Communist Party of China, which brought the liberalization of markets, privatizations in the economy and the distancing from revolutionary socialist Marxist doctrine with return to more traditional Chinese social and family values. Similar to much of Latin America and Africa, many Southeast Asian countries also fell into the hands of brutal right-wing strongmen, while in Pakistan, the military dictator Zia al-Haq would engage in a social experiment of extensive Islamization that would have far-reaching consequences. Only a handful of countries bucked that global trend by electing decidedly left-wing leaderships. And the Middle East was also about to undergo a massive transformation into becoming a more conservative place. When we think of the Middle East today, we think of it as a region of religious fanatics, a place where Islam rules over people's lives, where democratic values don't really exist, a place where secularism is a fantasy and religious-based bigotry is widespread. But this was not always the case. When the colonial rule collapsed, the peoples of the Middle East set out on a journey to define who they were. And many of these journeys were done by abandoning the old world with its old ways. وقابلت المرشد العام للإخوان المسلمين وقعد وطلب مطالب طلب إيه؟ أول حاجة قال لي يجب أن تقيم الحجاب في مصر وتخلي كل واحدة تمشي في الشارع تلبس طرح كل واحدة تمشي So <laughs> يا أستاذ أنت ليك بنت في كلية الطب مش لابسة طرحة ولا حاجة ما لبستهاش طرحة ليه؟ ده كنت أنت إذا كنت أنت مش قادر تلبس إذا كنت أنت مش قادر تلبس بنت واحدة اللي هي بنتك طرح 
عايزنا ننزل نلبس 10 مليون طرح في البلد نفس The Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, was the preeminent figure of leadership in the post-colonial Middle East. His solution to where the Arabs should go after the end of the caliphate and colonialism was socialism. Many others disagreed. Some would try nationalism, others constitutional monarchy, but modernization and openness were where most agreed upon. In many ways, many tried to copy Ataturk, from Egypt to Sudan to Yemen to Saudi Arabia to Iran. Today, the Middle East is often associated with religiously inspired terrorism, veiled women, bearded religious weirdos, religious bigotry, and a place to avoid if you are gay. But that was very different not too long ago. Beirut was known as the Paris of the Middle East, known for its nightclubs, bars, theatres, and even for its gay bars. Baghdad once had no veiled women to be found anywhere. Saudi Arabia used to have girl schools. Iran was once one of the most secular nations in the Middle East. Afghanistan was the favourite tourism destination of hippies, famed for its high-quality cannabis. And Egypt used to be famous for its movie stars and nightclubs. From the 1940s to the 1960s, much of the Middle East tried to radicalize redefine itself. And then all of that collapsed into itself. And like all things in history, there isn't one reason for why, but several. Arab nationalism was humiliated during the Six Day War, losing all its glitz and glamour. Arab socialism ended in economic failure and stagnation. Constitutional monarchs turned out to be authoritarian monarchs, brutalizing their people into submission. National unity gave way to religious sectarianism and tribalism, as different ethnic groups and religious groups were pitted up against each other. And there are eight events in particular that stand out, as they show where the Middle East would be heading next. In 1970, Hafiz al-Assad led a purge of the country's political elite, abandoned the country's previous socialist course and consolidated power within a small sectarian elite of Alawites in sectarian alliance with Shias against Sunnis. In 1975, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, who had driven an extensive program for modernizing Saudi Arabia, was assassinated by an Islamist. The reason was that the king had legalized television and had cracked down against Islamist protest against modernization, which the assassin had deemed as heretical. Also in 1975, civil war broke out between the various religious and ethnic groups of Lebanon, leading to a collapse of the multicultural social cohesion that would end with sectarian religious groups and fundamentalists seizing power. In 1976, Zia-ul-Haq led a coup against the socialist government of Pakistan, established a military dictatorship and embarked on an extensive program of Islamizing society by importing Wahhabi fanatics from Arab countries. In 1979, a group of armed Islamists seized and occupied the Grand Mosque in Mecca, holding thousands of hostages as they demanded a return to Islamic law, the subjugation of unbelievers and the abolition of television. Also in 1979, the brutal regime of the Iranian Shah came to an end at the hands of a popular revolt that would lead to a rise of an Islamic state. Also in 1979, the Iraqi Vice President Saddam Hussein, similar to what had happened in Syria at the start of the decade, organized a coup and purge that consolidated power within his inner circle of a Sunni Muslim clan, which would lead to an erosion of secularism and an increasing sectarianism. And in 1981, the last leader of the Arab socialist era, the president of Egypt, Anwar al-Sadad, was assassinated by a group of Islamists as punishment for agreeing to peace with Israel. His successor, Hosni Mubarak, would put the final nail into the coffin of Arab socialism. It is important not to fall into a deterministic trap when looking at the current state of the Middle East, the kind of thought process where one concludes that that place and the people living in it have always simply been like this and are doomed to forever being religious fundamentalists and reactionary authoritarians. Because that is simply not true. Islamism and the very notion of a modern Islamist theocracy are barely a century old, but they also did not appear out of nowhere the same year that Ataturk dismantled the caliphate, one of the binding institutions of Islamic societies around the world, an Egyptian Sunni cleric called Hassan al-Banna commented that Every rebirth that is not based on our faith diverges from the path of truth. It must therefore be resisted by all means, so it can be annihilated. And founded 
the Muslim Brotherhood. He would be murdered 10 years later, but it is his writings that formed the foundations of modern Islamist movements from Morocco to Indonesia. Before they came back into the public during the 1970s, they spent half a century in self-imposed exile and isolation. Much like the religious conservative Turks of Eastern Anatolia, they were politically closed off and reclusive. They had divergent ideas and differences, but were also well connected. From Shia clerics building networks reaching from Lebanon to Syria to Iraq and Iran, to Wahhabist networks of mosques and clerics stretching from Morocco through Saudi Arabia to Pakistan and Indonesia. They all spent spent those decades out of sight, building the Islamist political power structures that we know today, waiting for the moment they could finally resurface, which came in the late 1970s. But this is not part of Turkey's story, and there is a reason why I bring this up. I cannot emphasize enough how vastly different Turkish Islamism is from Islamism in Arab and other Muslim societies. Why? Well, remember, Turkey had spent almost half a century purposefully disconnecting itself from the Islamic world. It pursued integration into the Western geopolitical sphere with Europe and North America. Adding to that, all cultural ties to other Islamic countries were mostly cut. Turkey's relationship to her Arab neighbours, Iraq and Syria, were aggressive at best and at the brink of war at some point, but more on that later. And all other Turkic countries were outside of her sphere of influence as they were all under the Soviet Union. Devout Turkish Muslims were not just politically isolated and removed from the general public discourse and culture and politics in their homeland, they were also isolated and separated from their wider Muslim world. They were on their own, and as such, Turkish Islamism, but also Turkish Islam, started to evolve on its own, separate from others into something that is somewhat different. When Said Nursi wrote his reform pieces, he still advocated for a unified Islamic state, but the kernel of his writings was about resolving the conflict between religion and modernity, how concessions by the religious were required and democracy to be accepted, how religion can still find a place in the modern world. The conversation that Islamists within the remaining Islamic world had was very different. It mainly revolved around a rebellion against the modern world, how society can turn back the clock into previous centuries and how the modern secular world could be destroyed. Umar Öztoy is a Turkish Islamic theologian and professor who in his pieces wrote that only 10% of the Quran are actual dictates and rules for individuals or societies, and that most of the Islamic laws and rules implemented throughout Islamic societies in the world are merely the result of historic interpretations throughout the centuries. This, of course, is open to interpretation and how much this may actually be the case, but nevertheless, Öztoy, with his writings on the democratization of Islam, as well as the Turkish reform theologians like Mehmet Pachachi, Adil Çiftçi and Ilami Güler represent something special because they were only able to do so within a society that would allow such conversations to happen. In comparison, Nasser Hamid Abu Said, an Egyptian theologian who wrote similar texts, was arrested, charged with apostasy, divorced from his wife by the state and eventually had to flee to the Netherlands. Turkey was a place where the religious may have been ostracized and kept out of the socio-political public conversation, a place where the religious had to stay isolated in Anatolia, but it was a place where a conversation could take place. What evolved from this conversation was a set of multiple political Islamic sets of beliefs, practices and ideologies. Pluralism started to arrive in the East, especially throughout the late 1970s, and what it produced varied greatly, especially from how Islam is practiced elsewhere and can also be seen abroad. Visit the Islamic graveyard in Cologne and you will be able to differentiate the graves of Arab immigrants from Turkish immigrants, because the Turks leave red candles at the graves. This is a Catholic practice, but Turkish immigrants in Germany simply adopted it from their neighbors. If you ever travel to Turkey, you might notice that at old Greek Orthodox pilgrimage sites, Turkish Muslims often take the pilgrimage up the mountains to receive blessings from Christian priests and monks, a religious practice that many simply adopted from their Greek neighbors and continued even after the Greeks were gone. 
This cross-religious interaction is barely seen between religious communities of other majority Muslim countries. And if you are German, Dutch or Austrian free countries with large Turkish communities, you may have also at one point in your life been invited to attend the Islamic wedding of a friend who is a Turkish immigrant or descendant of Turkish immigrants. This astounded English and French friends whenever I tell them because in their Muslim communities, which are mainly of Pakistani and Arab origin, non-Muslims are close to never invited to such festivities as it would be a large religious taboo. The Turkish majority in the Muslim community is also a reason why Germany had less of an Islamist terrorism problem than other European countries. And Turkey itself has had less Islamist terrorist attacks than even many a European country. That is because Wahhabism, the Sunni Islamic doctrine of faith that justifies many such attacks, is not widespread in Turkey and is even rejected by most Turks. This goes so far that Turks, be they in Turkey, Germany, Austria or the Netherlands, will not go to mosques where the Imam is an Arab. And certainly not if he is a Wahhabi. Turks would for most see Wahhabism as foreign nonsense or even as a foreign Arab attempt at undermining their community. Religion in Turkey was able to evolve free from the strict orthodoxy that is so widespread across Arab countries. And even though most Turks remain Sunni Muslims, they are by and large distant from the ultra-conservative and mainly Arab notions of returning to basic social structures and tribal rules of the 7th century. Turkish Islamism, on the other hand, can be almost compared to the nostalgia that some very conservative British people have for the British Empire. In particular, the 16th century is seen as the golden age of not just the Turkish people, but of Islam itself. Compared to the reach and power of the Ottomans, who are those Arabs and why should we listen to them on how to build our society? A return to a religious golden age to Turkish Islamists doesn't mean a return to the 6th century of Arab tribalism, but a social return to the golden days of the Ottoman Empire. The strict and all-encompassing secularism of the Turkish state also furthered another unique political development. The strict laws and regulations to separate religion and state were not just enforced upon Muslims, but also upon Christians and Jews. Those may have had more political and economic freedoms in Turkey than in most other Muslim countries, but their religious freedoms were at times even more severely restricted than the religious freedoms that they would have had in Arab countries. Abandoned Christian churches were often used by the Turkish army as target practice for artillery. And in this situation, while in most Arab countries it was secular institutions and movements that claimed the role of being the protectors of religious minorities from Islamic bigotry, in Turkey it was Islamists who throughout the 70s and 80s claimed and earned the role of being the protectors of Christians as they stood up for their religious liberties against a secular state. Two distinct political movements emerged during the late 70s and early 80s. A radical branch of Islamists, populists, campaigning on promises of welfare for the poor, railing against corruption and elites, anti-Semitic undertones and demanding a return to Sharia, led by Nechmetin Erbakan. A difference between this extreme Islamist movement and Islamist movements throughout the Middle East is that despite its radical positions, it never resorted to outright violence or terrorism. It remained within the boundaries of the democratic institutions of the state. It is by and large more comparable with right-wing populist parties in Europe and it spent almost the entirety of the 1980s in political irrelevance. Nechmetin Erbakan founded his National Salvation Party in the 1970s and organized his rallies demanding that the Hagia Sophia be used as a mosque again. But he was throughout most of the 70s and 80s seen as a weird curiosity or even just as a clown nobody to be taken seriously, and even less cared for his deputy, some guy from the slums called Erdogan. A different iteration of Islamist politician came to shine during the 80s, as the army welcomed them into the open as an ally against communism. The most famous of which was to be Fethullah Gülen, an Islamic preacher who took inspiration from the newly developing Christian right that developed in the United States at the same time. Gülen created the Gülen Movement, an organization of various Islamic schools that were vastly different than the ones you would find financed by Saudi Arabia. No bearded weirdos raising kids to be bearded weirdos by constantly making them read the Quran over and over and over again. 
but schools that were, in appearance and curriculum, modern, no gender segregation, and a focus on education in secular matters, such as science and the humanities, the Gulen movement still preached religious, conservative social values, but encouraged its members to abide by secular rules, to shave their beards off, to wear suits and ties, that women didn't have to necessarily wear the veil, to go seek out higher education, especially in law and finance, and to go out and found a business. What Gulen and many like him wanted to create was a new modern Islamic conservative movement not grounded in fundamentalism but in a socially conservative tradition more comparable to American religious conservative social movements. Whilst the Arab Islamist may appear to you in beard and tawab angrily rambling about the indecency of unveiled women, the Turkish Islamist gradually changed into suit and tie. He became a moderately wealthy and successful owner of a small business or doctor or a successful criminal defense lawyer who might even reject the label of an Islamist entirely and would just call himself a conservative. Don't overthrow the system, but become part of it, to then maybe make the changes that you wish to implement. Through a gradual process, Islam returned into Turkey's politics throughout the 1980s, but that process was mainly slow and wouldn't fully come to fruition into actual political power until the 1990s. Politically, the 1980s would be dominated by someone else. Turgut Özal. He belonged to the first generation of republic-born, highly educated conservatives. An electrical engineer with a diploma from Istanbul, he would travel to the United States to receive further education in electrical engineering, electrical infrastructure management, and more crucial for his future political career, in business management. His time in the United States exposed him to the market ideas that drove economic policy and success within the United States, something that he would study and remember. After returning home to Turkey, he would take a leading role as a state bureaucrat in the electrification of the country, which garnered him a reputation as an incorruptible man of hard work who could get the task he faced done. He would spend the 1970s working for various private companies, building up further a reputation as a reliable business manager and economist that would eventually get him a job at the World Bank overseeing infrastructure development funds and loans right up to 1980. After the coup of 1980, the army wanted to resolve a problem that had plagued the country since Menderes, the continuing economic turmoil. The issues created by the large agriculture industry had not been resolved. The country still had problems providing its own steady supply of basic food because of the heavily export-orientated agriculture industry. Inflation kept rising and rising as the Turkish lira lost more and more of its value. By the 1970s, the average Turk's spending power collapsed as prices soared. The wages of average Turks had collapsed by half. And as the Germans stopped their labor import program in 1973, unemployment started rising again. The army turned to Turgut Özal. He was appointed deputy prime minister under the provisional military government and given what must have seemed to be an almost impossible task of fixing an economy that had been broken for almost 20 years. Meanwhile, the army made drastic changes to the country's constitution that would impact the country to this day. A 10% hurdle was introduced for all political parties. If a party didn't achieve at least 10% in an election, it would remain out of parliament. This was done in hope that it would keep the far left, the far right, the Islamists and the Kurds out of parliament and consequently out of the public eye and political conversation. Additionally, the Islamic faith was made a mandatory part of the school curriculum in an effort to clamp down on communism as various Islamic foundations and organizations received state support. After that, in 1983, they called for an election to hand governance back into civilian hands. Turgut Özal consequently founded the Motherland Party, a conservative centre-right political party campaigned on the promise of fixing the Turkish economy and got elected. He deregulated the financial market and provided incentives for international as well as Turkish banks to conduct more business in Turkey. The result of this was a substantial amount of capital was moved to Turkey. He reduced taxes and cut red tape in several industry sectors, making it easier to open and do business. All these reforms were part and parcel of a global trend in a similar economic policy direction. But his greatest economic success came when he opened up the country's hotel and service sector and invited and incentivized investors and hotel owners to build a tourism industry. 
This is something you may be familiar with if you are European, but less if you are from elsewhere. Turkey today is one of the largest tourism destinations in the world. Its white beaches surrounded by crystal blue water and dotted with ancient Greek ruins being a sight that many a European are familiar with. And that massive and popular tourism destination started being built during the 1980s. It employs at least 2 million people within the service sector, not counting related jobs created in other sectors. The total value of the sector switches with the holiday seasons and the location's popularity between $5 billion to $7 billion to even $14 billion in the second quarter of 2019, as millions of Europeans flood the Turkish beaches each summer and winter. Özal managed to resolve many of the country's economic issues and is consequently to this day revered by many Turks as one of the the best prime ministers the country has ever had. He created a middle class, mostly residing within the coastline, but also of seasonal Anatolian workers in the tourism sector. He brought substantial capital to the country. He made the country's voice more important on the international stage as he became an increasingly respected leader internationally. He also engaged Turkey in a far more active foreign policy than any of his predecessors. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, he embarked on the foreign policy of reintegrating the newly emergent independent Turkic countries into a Turkish sphere of influence outside of Russian influence. He built deepening economic ties within Far East Asian countries, in particular with Malaysia, and became the first serving Turkish Prime Minister to go on Hajj to Mecca, thereby cautiously rebuilding Turkish ties into Arab countries. But most significantly was that he created a class of wealthy business owners within Turkish society that would become an elite within itself. The previous social elites had mostly been bureaucrats and army officers who had worked their way up to power and influence through the state apparatus of the republic. Now, Turkey had wealthy business elites that gained social influence, wealth and power in an increasingly expanding private sector. These owners of hotels, construction companies, banks and other would in the future play a significant role in Turkish politics as well as become the backbone of the new democratic Islamic conservative movement that Özal helped create. Create. From him also stems the somewhat famous quote, The state is secular, the nation is not, which in the West is often interpreted as an admission of defeat of the secular republic. However, it is meant in the exact opposite way. Özal was fully aware that many conservative voters did not agree with the separation of religion and state, yet he was determined to underline that the new Turkish religious conservative would also not challenge that separation and be first and foremost committed to democracy. His popularity increased so much that when his terms as prime minister came to an end, he became the first president of the republic who was not an army general. However, his terms in office did not come without shortcomings and failures. Özal was himself half Kurdish and determined to find a peaceful resolution to the conflict with the Kurds throughout the 1980s, and that that he failed. The army was determined to end that conflict by military means, but another problem also hampered all attempts to make peace. In Syria, governing power had fallen almost completely into the hands of the ruthless Assad family, who dreamt of a greater Syria, stretching from the Sinai Peninsula through Lebanon and into large parts of Anatolia. To achieve such, the Assads would spend much of their time in power destabilizing their neighbors as much as they could, including Turkey, where they saw the Kurds as the best vehicle to do so. Starting in the 1970s, the Syrian government built an extensive network providing training, weapons, explosives and base for Kurdish terror groups and then smuggling them across the border. The Turkish government and army mistakenly believed that the Soviets were behind it all and it took them a long time to figure out that it was a sad Syria, which would extremely sour relations between Turkey and Syria for decades to come and really even to this day. Many abroad and domestically viewed Turgut Özel as the democratizer of Islam, the first to establish a democratic conservative Islamic movement that could act and work within the boundaries of a secular democracy. And even though this made him many friends, it also increasingly made him a lot of enemies. The army who had helped and supported people like him when the decade began viewed him with increasing suspicion. So did the secular center-left, which also disapproved of his economic liberalizations. The far right couldn't stand him, and the religious populist right, which gained more and more influence as the decade came to a close, also framed him as a corrupt phony who sold out on true Islamic virtues. However, 
none of his enemies could change his enormous popularity amongst common Turks. As such, it came as a shock when he suddenly died in office at the age of 65. Suspicions were voiced at the time on the mysterious circumstances of his death, but the state prevented any investigations. Two decades later, his body was exhumed for an autopsy which found that he had indeed been poisoned. Who, however, was responsible is something that we will probably never know. The Hagia Sophia is a museum in Istanbul, though it has not always been. Built during the late Roman Empire of the East, it would be a cathedral to Orthodox and Greek Christians for centuries as the largest Christian house of worship in the world. After the Ottoman conquest, minarets were added and it became a mosque. To the Ottomans, it became a symbol of their conquest of Rome. Its beauty is renowned around the world. And on a side note, my personal favorite part of it is neither Islamic nor Christian. It's this piece of vandalism, a line of Germanic text carved into one of the balconies about 1,500 years ago, which roughly translates to Harkon was here. The Byzantines bought slaves from Swedish Vikings as well as hired them as mercenaries, and one of these pagan Norsemen, called Harkon, seemed to have felt the need to leave his mark on history. When Ataturk founded his republic, he kicked the Imams out of the Hagia Sophia. It was to neither be a mosque nor a church. For centuries it had been the symbol of an Islamic empire, an empire that he had abolished, so he declared it a museum to the past. And as such, it spent its time throughout the Republic. But during the 1980s, some guests started to appear. Nechmetin Erbakan, the leader of the Islamist Salvation Party, increasingly started showing up in front of it, protesting that the Hagia Sophia must become a mosque again. Throughout the 1980s, he would rally there railing against the decadence of the country's business and political elites, rambling about how degenerate women who refuse to wear the veil are, demanding the death penalty for homosexuals, railing against Christians, railing against Jews, demanding the return of Sharia, the return of the caliphate, proclaiming that only through a return to Islam in state matters and policy and law can society be made virtuous and good again. And for most of that time, he was laughed at, seen as a clown, a relic from the past, as something that was slightly amusing. People, however, simply didn't notice how the crowds attending his rallies kept getting bigger and bigger as time went by. The 1980s had been the decade of the yuppies, new, rich, young businessmen, who may have publicly extolled conservative virtues while not necessarily living up to those virtues themselves. With the growth of capital and wealth, wealth inequality also came to rise. The gap between the haves and have-nots kept growing, and more and more people eyed these developments with resentment. The left, who had usually called out such social inequalities, had been beaten into silence by the army. So it was the Islamists, in particular the Islamist right, who jumped on it as an opportunity. And then came the 90s. Throughout the 1980s, the abolished restrictions on financial markets and the opening to global markets, while the government still had a large budget deficit and high interest rates, led to a tsunami of money flooding the banking system. With that tsunami, the value of the Turkish lira rose dramatically despite interventions in the foreign exchange market by the central bank to keep the Turkish lira weak against the US dollar. The very short-term nature of the high interest government debt bonds, together with the rising value of the currency, encouraged the Turkish private banks to borrow in foreign currency and as they dished out loans onto the Turkish economy from their newly available foreign currency, corporations, households and even the government stood to board a debt gravy train. In short, risky but high profit behaviour. With the liberalisation and its ensuing effects, the bank's ability to get easy money abroad allowed the continual postponement of what was, however, an inevitable end to that debt gravy train. As the 90s came, investors started to question the ability of the lenders to repay the vast short-term loans, and the system 
went bust. Just before the crisis in 1994, Turkey had unsustainably high debt-fueled growth, a currency which had increased in value against the US dollar by 8.9%, an increased current account deficit which stood at 5% of its GDP, and it had little foreign exchange reserves to pay for the imports it was consuming. The budget deficit was climbing too. To top it all off, high inflation and high real interest rates and a weak banking system which was very much reliant on the global market due to their aforementioned questionable lending schemes. In mid-January 1994, Turkey's ratings were downgraded to non-investment junk grade, which started the capital outflow which led to an even higher demand for foreign currency, causing the value of the Turkish lira to fall like never before. Finally, the government's insistence on lowering the interest rates to keep its own borrowing cheap gutted any remaining confidence and fully brought about an economic crisis in 1994. The Turkish Central Bank hastily intervened in the foreign exchange market and lost more than half of its foreign currency reserves to defend the currency and was left with a mere $3 billion to counter any future trouble. The Turkish Central Bank also hiked the overnight interest rates to 700% and inflation rose to 103% compared to an already abysmal 60% in 1993. The consequences of that was a rush to the banks by Turks to convert their liras to dollars to escape the imminent collapse of the currency's value as lenders quit Turkey. The Prime Minister at the time was Tanzu Çiller, the first woman to become Prime Minister of Turkey. But you won't find her praised or celebrated like other women who were elected to lead their countries as a first, because she is considered to be one of the worst Prime Ministers Turkey ever had. She came to represent some of the worst aspects of Turkish politics that had developed throughout the 1980s. Over the 1980s, Turkish politics had become increasingly corrupt, something that was frequently swept under and ignored while the economy was booming. But when the crisis came, it could no longer be hidden. The extensive privatizations of Turkish national assets had often been done in collaboration with the country's wealthy elites, meaning that if state companies were sold off, they were often not just put on sale to the general public, but handed over to wealthy Turks and the country's business elites through pre-arranged backroom deals. Policies and practices that continued under Chilla, who was blocked by the Supreme Court when she attempted to privatize the Turkish Telecom. She also managed to collect a considerable personal fortune while in office through probably not exactly legal means. She also wasn't elected but became Prime Minister when her predecessor, who was from a different party, resigned office to become President, representing yet another aspect of Turkish politics at the time that many found frustrating. The enormous number of political parties several left-wing parties, several conservative parties with barely any differences between them, but for some weird reason this multitude still continued to exist, generating even more complex and insipid networks of varying political alliances and coalitions between parties and politicians. Adding to that, during her time in office the conflict with the Kurds escalated drastically. She approved of what became known as the Castle Strategy, which was in essence a dirty war meaning counter-guerrilla-guerrilla warfare, something that could be summarized as terrorizing terrorists, meaning to isolate communities that may at some point have produced a terrorist and to terrorize them in the hope that they would as a result not produce more. This included the random shelling of Kurdish villages, arbitrary arrests, constant lockdowns and curfews, the cutting of basic infrastructure and supplies, but most controversially of all, she hired right-wing thugs and gangsters, including from the Grey Wolves, to carry out extrajudicial assassinations sanctioned not by the state but by her office. It is in this chaos that Nechmetin Erbakan's rallies started getting more and more traction. Railing against the corruption of the banks and the state, he set up his deputy Recep Tayyip Erdogan to run for mayor of Istanbul, who was initially laughed at but to the surprise of everyone won. The political establishment had been blind to one of the most significant demographic changes in the country's recent history. In 1950, only 14% of farm labourers had owned no farmland. As the agricultural sector moved into becoming a sector dominated by large landowners, it dramatically changed the difference in income. By 1977, 58% of profits made in the agricultural sector went to 7% of the population. The fact that produce was mainly grown for large-scale export also meant 
that large stretches of land were often unattended to keep the prices stable. Combined with the automation of the farming industry, the redundant farm laborers had over decades moved into the cities in ever-increasing numbers, in ever-growing slums, with ever greater income inequality. In 1900, the population of Istanbul was at a million. By 1960, it was at one and a half million. By 1985, it was at six million. And by 1995, the population of Istanbul had reached 10 million. Today, it lies at 15 million. In Ankara, the population rose from 30,000 in 1923 to one and a half million in 1970 and to two and a half million by 1989. In Izmir, the population rose from 200,000 in 1930 to a million by 1990, of which 60% were migrant laborers who lived in the slums called Gecikondu. These developments were happening throughout all major Turkish cities, where these new arrivals had almost always been ignored and left to themselves by a political establishment that saw them as backward Anatolians. And what they realized far too late in the 90s was that these people could also vote. The political east-west binary of the Republic was thereby broken. Furthermore, the trend of privatization fueled this social conflict. For most of the 20th century, Turkish media was under government control or pressure or was ideologically aligned with the existing Kemalist establishment, which made anti-authoritarian currents harder to organize, especially after the 1980 coup and crackdown. Arabesque music, for example, was outright banned for a decade. Turks had to tune in into Cypriot or Syrian radio to listen to Arabesque music. Filmmakers, authors and musicians were either brought under state authority or exiled, such as Cem Karaca. The Turkish movie industry started by producing Turkified versions of foreign dramas or making cheap propaganda movies. This can be best seen in the swashbuckling adventures of Cunit Arkin, an actor whose movies included a hefty amount of anti-Greek or anti-communist messages, usually by a Rambo-like Arkin fighting his way through hordes of enemies and saving the damsel in distress from the Byzantine emperor. This all changed with the trend of privatization under Özal. In 1990, Turkey's first private television channel, Star TV, was launched. This changed Turkish society. Television was no longer a novelty. It became part of family life as people began to be bombarded by an influx of foreign news, movies and music shows. The vast majority of the Turkish population was exposed to liberal foreign media for the first time. No longer was sexuality suppressed or people shown as monolithic enemies or friends, the Turkish youth of the 1990s who voted mostly for opposition parties today were raised with Western television and entertainment, but in time this led to authoritarian militarism collapsing. By 1995 the Islamic Welfare Party had won the mayoral elections in six major Turkish cities, and amongst them Recep Tayyip Erdogan began to make a name for himself as the mayor of Istanbul. A city that had for decades been neglected and plagued by corruption was made to shine. Sewage systems and water pipes were expanded into the poverty-stricken parts of the city. Highways, bus lines and increased funding for schools and sports. Erdogan built his political national recognition on the substantial changes and successes he achieved in Istanbul. From here on, he would start a career that would significantly change the country. The name Islamic Welfare Party was not chosen by mistake. Abakan didn't just appeal to the voters through an appeal to religion as a cultural expression. Abakan's political successes were built on a harsh condemnation of the modern republic. He decried capitalism and demanded a new social order based on Sharia that would respect the small farmer, the small trader and would have a Sharia-based welfare system. Already during the 1980s, the Islamic Welfare Party had made a name for itself through soup kitchens for the poor. This model was the same as in every somewhat secular Islamic society challenged by Islamist groups, from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Abakan became increasingly popular and the remaining parties tried all they could to keep him out of any power, forming a weird set of coalitions of liberals, conservatives, the far right, the far left, in a secular alliance that was intent to keep them out at any means. But by 1996, Nechmetin Erbakan's party had become so popular that they could no longer be kept out of power. Erbakan became the first Islamist prime minister of Turkey. However, they had greatly overestimated their power. Within a year of being in government, the Turkish army intervened and announced that if the government didn't resign, they would seize power. 
The great myth about this, the fourth coup in Turkish history, is that the coup itself never really took place. Merely the threat of a military coup was enough to scare the Islamists out of power. In their memories, the brutal cleansings of the last coup were still fresh and they wished to avoid a similar bloodbath as the left had experienced amongst their own supporters. One of the defining images of this coup is a livid Erdogan climbing a podium during an Islamist rally after his mentor Erbakan had resigned and citing a poem by the young Turk writer Zia Gökal. <laughs> He was arrested and thrown in prison for a year and it must have seemed to many within the political establishment that this Islamist mess was now over. But they couldn't have been further from the truth. During the late 90s and early 2000s, the political establishment managed to pass some significant policies, such as a normalization of relations between Turkey and Greece, which was however admittedly largely driven by artists and musicians in both countries. But most significantly, a refusal by Turkey to join the United States and Britain in their war against Iraq, a stance it took together with Germany and France in the hope of tying Turkey deeper into Europe. But the Islamist genie could not be forced back into the bottle, no matter what successes the political establishment could have delivered. For seven decades, generations of Turkish politicians had pursued Ataturk's vision. And that vision mainly lay in the West, of a Turkey and its people standing unified and as equals amongst modern nation states. But that vision had started to crumble. It was built on a nationalist vision, a vision that erased all differences in culture and a vision that tolerated no aberrations. It made the promise of a better future, yet that future seemed to always be just around the corner. Attempts to tie to Turkey into Europe crashed onto the Cyprus question time and time again, and many Turks started to see themselves as being looked down upon by their European neighbours. That no matter where the country may go, most in the West would consider them to be nothing but backward Anatolian peasants. When Erdogan was released from prison, he rejoined the Islamist political struggle, who had simply rallied into a new party, the Virtue Party, who in 1999 won several seats, including for female members, in the Turkish parliament. A parliament in which it was forbidden to wear headscarves. Hanımların giyim kuşamına, başörtüsüne özel yaşamlarında hiç kimse karışmıyor. Ancak burası hiç kimsenin özel yaşam mekanı değildir. Burası devletin en yüce kurumudur. Burada görev yapanlar, burada görev yapanlar devletin kurallarına, geleneklerine uymak zorundadırlar. Burası devlete meydan okunacak yer değildir. Lütfen bu hanıma haddini bildiriniz.
This, a famous moment in recent Turkish history, is a very uncomforting clip to watch. Even if you yourself might find overt religiosity and political religiosity rejectable and be an ardent defender of secularism, this moment and the way Mevre Kavakci is treated simply comes across as misogynistic. And that was the point. When Erdogan came back into Turkish politics during the late 90s, what the Islamists had specialized in were these types of targeted and deliberate provocations. Not the kind that were reactionary, but the type that turned the understanding of the modern world on its head. The veil is forced upon women in many Islamic countries, where refusal to wear it is often brutally punished. In many ways and in many countries, it is a symbol of male dominance over women. And if you ever wondered how throughout the early 2000s it was rebranded and remarketed into a symbol of women's liberation, it started here. Women who wore the veil in Turkey could not attend university, enter a public building to either stand for office, vote, or even just to apply for or receive their benefits. One group of people who were particularly maligned by all this were young single mothers who happened to be religious, an opportunity which the Islamists seized by offering them charity and also promising them a better life under a less restrictive state. The late 90s saw riots in the streets of Turkish cities like had never occurred before, not by men, zealots or leftists, but by veiled women. The political establishment had branded itself and seen itself as a liberator of women who had freed them from the shackles of religion. And with this really smart move, the Islamists made them look like the oppressors of women. The Islamists shed the image of religious zealotry. They rebranded themselves as liberators, as open people, people who wanted to protect the vulnerable from a zealous secular state and its ruthless capitalism. They also questioned the founding myth of this state. Why do we fight the Kurds? Aren't the Kurds fellow Muslims? Why not make peace with the Armenians? In these days, the Islamists even spoke on behalf of equal rights for gays and lesbians. They took on every cause which they could use to undermine the image of progress and modernity that the secular political establishment had built. No longer seen as scary fanatics, even left-wing voters started rallying behind them, who saw in their message validation of theirs that had been so brutally crushed by the army. In panic, the political establishment attempted to form ever more absurd coalitions and alliances. Coalition governments of the center-left, far-left, conservatives and far-right nationalists were supposed to keep the Islamists out, but increasingly did nothing but expose their own internal conflicts. The Supreme Court banned the Virtue Party as being anti-secular and therefore unconstitutional, but they merely reorganized into a new party, Erdogan's Justice and Development Party. The political establishment mocked Erdogan for being an uneducated peasant, an Anatolian know-nothing from the slums, but they didn't realize that his humble background is exactly what made so many Turks identify with him. Every time they mocked him, they merely made him more popular in the public eye. And as the year 2002 rolled in, the Justice and Development Party had a sweeping election victory, gaining a two-thirds majority in Parliament. The country was about to undergo the most drastic changes that it had seen since Ataturk. And here, at the end of part two, there's something I feel obliged to do. You all have been waiting three months for this video and a group of artists amongst you decided to contact me and help me finish this project faster. Winter Owl, Quadrat, Nomad, Umbrella Head and Philoi. Without their help and contributions, we would have probably waited at least another two or even three weeks for this video to finish. I am beyond grateful for their help. Quadrat is a Polish artist and I will be leaving a link to his art station in the description. As far as I know, he also takes commissions. Nomad is an Italian artist and I will be leaving links to his Twitter, DeviantArt and YouTube in the description. I believe he also takes commissions. And Umbrella Head asked me to leave a link to his Twitter here. Thank you very much for jumping in to help finish this video. I hope those amongst you who are patrons won't mind that I will be giving a share of the income of this video to them. I'll see the rest of you when part three of this series is finally finished.